be seated. Studying verses we've already studied in John 6. 
So we'll, we'll, mark, we'll work through these first three qualities pretty quickly. First of all, false disciples are attracted by the crowd. False disciples are attracted by the crowd. I would like to think that you're here at New Life this morning because you're attracted to the worship, Amen. that you're attracted by the teaching and preaching of the Word of God, that you're attracted by the love of fellow believers that come here, and that's why you're here. And thus a crowd of people then results. But it would be my hope this morning that you're not attracted here just by the crowd. See, false disciples are oftentimes attracted by a crowd. And that means that some will show up here. And as we begin to look at this in the Gospel of John at this issue, this is a, in this particular section, this is where we are introduced to these false disciples. And I'll add this, that oftentimes false disciples appear as genuine disciples. They're indistinguishable between the two. And not only will false disciples show up because they're attracted to crowds, genuine disciples will fall, will come because they're attracted to crowds. The majority of times, these people are indistinguishable, at least initially. And that's how we begin this chapter, if you want to look at John, chapter 6, verse 1. That's where we're going to begin these things this morning. And it says in verse 1, after these things, John's re referring back to the 5th chapter. And what happened at the, in the 5th chapter happened approximately a year earlier than what happens in chapter 6. Chapter 5 is the early Galilean ministry of Jesus. Chapter 6 is the end of the Galilean ministry of Jesus. And if you don't want to know what happened in between chapter 5 and chapter 6 of John, just go to the other three Gospels, and all those holes are filled in for you there, okay? So this is a narrative. John is writing a narrative. What has happened at the end of Jesus' ministry in Galilee? And, as we've looked at previously, there's a large pe group of people following him. A great great crowd. Estimates between 20 and 25,000 people following him. Hang on to that idea. A big group of people. Jesus is a cop, he's accumulating a great mass of people wherever he goes in Galilee. He's been there for a while now, and it's a societal fact that crowds attract <coughs> crowds. Did you know that? Crowds attract crowds. And Jesus is out healing people. He's delivering people from demons. And he has a massive amount of popularity. There are some accounts written about this time in history that say that the people were actually stepping on each other. They were, he was so popular that people were crushing each other to get near him. Jesus is the most popular person in Galilee. He's the most popular person in all of Israel. He is the event of these people's lifetime. Nobody has ever seen a miracle worker like Jesus. In fact, generations have gone by. No one has seen miracles like this. God has temporarily removed his hand from his chosen people. There haven't been any miracles like this. But on a daily basis, most times from morning till dusk, Jesus is performing miracles and teaching people about his Father almost every day. And as he does that, his popularity grows and grows and grows. And there's a massive crowd of people following them. And many of them are following him because that's what everybody's doing. Have you ever followed anybody because some, everybody else is doing it? Have you? You know how it works out? Sometimes you're walking down the street and you see a crowd of people and you go up and you try to see what's going on in the crowd of people and then you turn around and there's more people behind you because they're trying to see what's going on with the crowd of people. You wonder what's going on? 
You know, I grew up in Tucson. And in the 1960s, at the University of Arizona, there were Vietnam War riots. I was a kid. But you know what? I went to the riots. You know why? Because there was a crowd there. I thought it was cool. Until I got tear gas. And I said, it's time to go home. But a mob, a mob, a group of people naturally attracts other people. Okay? And here's a guy, he's chasing demons out of people. He's healing people of physical misery. And the crowds of results. And crowds attract crowds. There's an energy in a crowd. I love to go to sports events. U of A football, U of A basketball. There's energy in the, well, not the football team. The basketball <laughs> team, usually, usually there's energy there. That draws people. People get it. I, Tiff and I went to a game a few years ago when they played Florida, University of Florida against Arizona. They were both ranked in the top ten. Arizona won the game in the last seconds on a layup by Mark Lyons. And when he, went, when he did that, everybody in the crowd was best friends with everybody else. <laughs> everybody was high-fiving high -fiving and jumping around. Now, don't take me wrong. There will be crowds, crowds attract false disciples. They also attract true followers. And your outline, the word is true. There will be true followers that get attracted by a crowd. There will be those that get converted. But there's a guarantee whenever you have a crowd, there's going to be false followers in their crowd. So that's a simple place to start. That's a simple thing for us to remember. One of the false characteristics of a false disciple is they follow the crowd. They want to be part of the crowd. Number two, followers, false followers, are fascinated, the word in your outline is, with the supernatural. Fascinated by the supernatural. You can bring a crowd to a football or a basketball game, that's not supernatural. But if you start saying, God is here, he is here. If you start saying, God can change your life today, he can change your life today. If you start saying, God will physically heal you, he may physically heal you if you tell people, come here today, you're going to see a miracle here today. It may change your career. It might change your family's economics. You might get a social miracle today. You might get an, an economic miracle. miracle. You, just, you just don't know what you might get here today. We're, this is a supernatural place today. If you start telling that to people, they'll get caught up in it. Because people, most people today in our society are caught up in the ordinary. The word in your outline is ordinary. And you know what? People don't like to be ordinary. And that's what happened in Jesus' day. In a huge way, you remember the story we've already looked at. Jesus heals people, okay, at this, the feeding of the 5,000, multiplied up to about 25,000 when you include the families, the, the children, and the women. He feeds people. He, he does healings throughout the day. A massive miracle. All the people participated in the miracle because they all got a chance to eat the food. They all ate all they wanted. There was 12 baskets left over, one for each disciple. His power was displayed, a power that was beyond their imagination. They saw him. He took the fish. He took the bread. The few pieces that he had, he began to pr pray to God to thank him for the food, and it started to multiply. And they just started handing it out. I read a, I read a, sto a scientific study. I read too much. Are you familiar with Einstein's formula, E equals MC squared? It means energy equals mass squared. It's a simple formula, but in that formula, this guy wrote that 
what it, the power that it took to make that food, if we were going to equate it to earthly power, would mean that the electrical power on the earth would have to run at 100% of, it, of its output 100% of the time for four years. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's powerful. That's who the Son of God is. So people are fascinated by miracles. There have been whole movements that have, that have centered on sets of supposed miracles, some of, some of which have ended in, ended in bitter, bitter scandals. Does God still do miracles today? Shake your head, you better know it. But does God do miracles at your beck and call? Shake your head, no, he doesn't. But that's why people come sometimes, because they're guaranteed almost miracles. A repeatedly, over and over in the New Testament, it says again and again, the people were drawn, and your outline the words are, by signs and wonders. Signs pointing the way to the deity, deity of Jesus Christ. Wonders, his miracles. They followed him because of his miracles. Fascinated by his miracles. Yet back in John chapter 2, we saw where the people believed in his name because they saw the signs that he did. Nicodemus came to Jesus in chapter 3 of John. He said, we know you're sent from God because nobody can do what you do unless God is with him. See, many false disciples follow Christ because of the supernatural aspect of Christ. Maybe they want a different level of life. I think that's a huge reality in, in people's lives today. You know, life can be pretty normal, pretty ordinary, sometimes painfully ordinary. Sometimes things don't seem like they're going anywhere. You know what? You may not know this, but interpersonal relationships can be rough sometimes. Families can be a mess. There's disappointments all around us each and every day. And if somebody comes along and says, in the name of Jesus, and they offer you health, and they offer you wealth, and they offer you prosperity, and they offer you happiness, and they offer you satisfaction and fulfillment. Or some may come along and, and say, you can even be a God. And you can be a God and you can have your own world. And you can even speak that world into existence. There's people that believe that all around us. Do you know that? Do you know that? You should know that. Those folks, they don't have to do a healing miracle. All they do is dangle that carrot. If you do this work, you can be your own God. You can have your own planet. That, ladies and gentlemen, will attract a crowd. Even though not one word of it is true, according to the word of God. Remember, if you looked in the book of Acts, Simon Magus, 8th chapter of Acts, he tried to buy supernatural power. He literally went up and asked if he could buy the power of the Holy Spirit. And Peter said, no way. Your money perished with you because you thought the gift of God could be purchased with money. People want supernatural power. See, people want to buy into the supernatural. And there's no question about that. Listen, religion has, is, and will continue to flourish all over the world, all over the planet, with the exception of a few atheists, the world is totally, habitually religious. And I believe it's because people are desperate to get above their present condition, to get above the norm. And that's why some of these religions flourish. Islam. Buddha, some of these religions flourish because of people's desire to work to better them, themselves in a way, in a spiritual nature. 
And that's a perfect nature, that's a perfect environment to develop false disciples. People that are drawn by a crowd to start with, and then they're fascinated with the supernatural. Maybe in a healing sense, maybe in a social sense, Maybe in an economic sense, whatever sense. And then that leads us to the last category, characteristic, that I want to talk about today. False disciples, they think only of, in your outline, the words are earthly benefits. They think only of earthly benefits. Remember what they said back in verse 14. The people had decided, they said, this is truly the prophet who was to come into the world, John 6, 14. That is a messianic reference that comes from Deuteronomy 18. In Deuteronomy 18, Moses is writing, and he said there would come a prophet like him, but one that would be far greater. So it's a good thing, see? They finally become to equate Jesus Christ to the Messiah. Okay? They're beginning to make that connection with Old Testament, Old Testament messianic prophecy. They're beginning to see maybe Jesus is the Messiah. So that's great. And what's he been talking to them about all day? What's he been telling them that whole day as he's been healed, drove out demons? What's he preaching about? Well, if you look in the other Gospels, it'll tell you what he's been preaching about. He has been preaching the kingdom of God. And what's the kingdom of God? I could go 10, 15 sermons on that. But I'll tell you succinctly what the kingdom of God is not. John 18, 36 and 37. Jesus himself says, my kingdom is not my kingdom is not of this world. That's the kingdom of God. So when he's preaching the kingdom, he wasn't talking about temporal things, about this life. He wasn't talking about the here and now. He wasn't talking about the land they had their feet on. He wasn't talking about the political issues that concerned them. That's not what he was talking about. He was talking about the kingdom of God. He was talking about the eternal kingdom of God over and over in which God rules our lives both here in this temporary world and in eternity. He's speaking about being redeemed, those who repent and believe and are saved. And so, on this day, he arrived early in the morning. Him and his disciples went up the hill to rest. And they rest just a few minutes. They wanted to talk about what had been going on in the ministry. They go up on the hill, and here comes this crowd. And they disturb them. As the crowd approaches, Jesus knows, I've got to go down there. And the crowd comes to him, and he spends the rest of the day doing what? Well, healing their diseases, driving out demons, healing their illnesses, teaching them kingdom principles. The kingdom, the, the principles of basic salvation. And so they come to this conclusion, it says, that he is the prophet who is to come, and what do they want to do with him? Well, verse 15, Jesus reads their mind. Just like we read back earlier when we studied in John 2, Jesus had no need that anyone should testify of man, because Jesus knows what is in man. Jesus knows what you're thinking of him right now here, right now. You don't need to tell him. He already knows. He already knows according to the word of God. Nobody needed to tell Jesus anything about anybody. So he reads their minds and collectively they are intending to come and they want to take him by force and make him they want to make him their their savior? No, they don't want to make him their savior. That isn't what they wanted to do. It doesn't say that they fell down on their knees and honored him, does it? No, they didn't honor him. 
It doesn't say that they repented of their sins, does it? Does it say that they believed in him? Well, that's not what it says. What did they want to do? They wanted to make him a, a king. That's what they wanted. They wanted a king. Because of all they could think of, after that day of teaching, all that they could think of are the earthly benefits of having Jesus as their king. They wanted their independence from Rome. They're tired of those Romans. We're Jews. We're more important than Romans. I tell you another thing they probably wanted. They wanted some more of that food. Because can you imagine if Jesus sat down and makes you some fish? <coughs> Heavenly fish? That's got to be the best fish you ever had. If he gets some if he gets some barley crackers, those are the best barley crackers that have ever ever been eaten by anyone. Okay? They want some more of that food. And not only do they want that food, they want that food when they want that food. They want to be healed. They want to have the kind of power. They want to see that power repeated. And they want it strongly enough. They want it strongly enough. They want it to take him, it says in verse 15, by force. Usually when you take somebody by force, you're going to haul them, uh, them off to the jail cell. Right? That's what it usually replies to. Or maybe you, you uh, take somebody by force and you hold them for ransom. But they wanted to kidnap Jesus to make him their king. They had never seen anybody like this before. Never, ever. And their only response was, we can't let this guy get away. We've got to keep this guy with us. He can create for us everything we need in the here and now. Perfect living condition. He can, he's got great power. He can feed us. He can defeat our enemies. He can heal us from whatever disease we might have. He can chase away demons. He can do whatever we want him to do. Whatever we want him to do. Whatever we want him to do. But you see, this is the characteristic of a false disciple. Because they only think of earthly benefits. And if that's what you offer, when, when, when people stand in pulpits and offer earthly benefits to people, they play into false disciples' hands. And if that's what the preacher talks about, that Jesus wants to give you this, and Jesus wants to give you this, and Jesus wants to give you this, you'll, you'll, fact, you'll attract false followers, I can tell you that. <coughs> people are drawn already by the supernatural. They're drawn by the crowd already. Crowd draws a crowd. Super, the promise of supernatural things draws a crowd. The desire for earthly, temporal satisfaction and fulfillment draws the crowd. It's a main attraction. They just wanted to get, they just wanted Jesus to give them what they wanted. But you better hold on to your horses. Because Jesus, you can't use Jesus for your own ends today. Do you hear me? Amen. Amen, Luke. You cannot use Jesus for what you want. You can go back to the Old Testament. 1 Samuel chapter 4. 1 Samuel chapter 4. The children of Israel are being confronted by the Philistines. God had sent the Philistines to punish his people. And they're, they're confronted by this great Philistine army. And they're afraid the Philistines are going to defeat them. So they get together and they, well, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? And somebody said, well, the ark of God is at Shiloh. Go get the box. Go get the ark. Four foot, two and a half foot, two and a half foot. Go get the box. See, by that time, the nation of Israel had so twisted up their thinking that, that they worshipped a box. 
They were, they, had beca they, were, they were involved in what I would call idol worship. Where's the box? The box will save us. They've been so unfaithful to God that they deserved the punishment that God was getting ready to inflict on them. So they said, the, the, the cure for that is, go get the box. We need some temporary benefit here. Go get me a box. So they sent a group of people to Shiloh and they brought back the box. And the Philistines said, oh man, the box is here. They did, they were scared of the box. <coughs> they knew what had happened in Egypt. They knew the stories of the Ark of the Covenant when God delivered his chosen people. But God's people weren't functioning as God's people. So the Philistines said, well, let's go to battle anyways. And what happened? 30,000 Israeli men were massacred. Did the box make a difference? No, and what happened to the box? The Philistines took the box. See, don't come to church looking for how you can use God today. Because if you come for that reason, you're here for the wrong reason. You just don't use God. You don't use His Son. But a lot of people today will offer you that idea that God is your genie. Come here, God. I want this today. That He's your cosmic bellhop. Do you remember what a bellhop is? Back in the old days in Old Town, they rang the bell and the bellhop would come and get your bags. God is not your bellhop today. He's not going to He's not, he's not going to call, he's not going to come and fix everything for you. That's a formula for attracting false disciples. So I always try to end every sermon with a question. Put up that review slide for me, Mr. Uh, Andrew. Yeah. You can't? No. What happened? We had a, a, an error of... Uh, <laughs> I don't have a review slide. You don't have a review slide. Okay, well, that's, I, that's temporary anyways. <laughs> I didn't need it. <laughs> okay. So what I've tried to talk to you about today is these characteristics of false disciples. And I'll expand upon that as when I return. But I want, what I want you to see is I want you to consider let me ask you a question. Why, oh why did you come to church today? Did you come? Because there's a crowd? Did you come seeking something supernatural for yourself? Did you come because you, 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 you thought, well, if I come today, maybe God will help me pay my bill. And whatever you do today, don't take me wrong. Because in many regards, God can do all those things for you. Amen. If they're in his will. Amen. 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 But you have to come with him with a contrite, repentant heart and allow him to work through you for you to realize all he has for you. You know, when I was 38, sitting in an alcohol rehab center in Wichita Falls, Texas, I wasn't understanding how fulfilling the life of being with Jesus Christ could be. I, I shivered. I dread to think where I might not, where I might be today if it wasn't for my Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. And I don't tell you that to make me look good. I tell you that because He is good. We've got to get out, the, the modern American church has to get out of the motif of what is God going to give me? And we 
need to start functioning within the motif of what am I going to give God today? What's your sacrifice to him today? What are you doing for Jesus Christ today? It's time. Look at the country. Look at this nation. It's a disaster. Who's going to change it? The politicians? Huh. Come on. You know who will change it? It's these guys over here. These young guys. These guys here. People like that. That's who will change it. Him here, these young people. That's why it's so important to found them and ground them in the Word of God. Amen. Those little kids over there in that nursery that are learning that Jesus Christ is their Lord and Savior and He went to the cross and died for them. That's what's important. These temporary things, hey, I can do without. You can tell I can do without. Okay? But everybody, everybody, everybody needs a Savior. And we know it. And it's our job to tell everybody. Come on up, praise and worship. Stand with me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for my word, Lord. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to, to study your word. I have the best job in the world. All I do every week is study your word and speak to people about Jesus Christ. And Lord, as we look at your word, it's so full of examples for our life the way we should live, the way we should bring up our children, the way we should conduct ourselves. All the answers to all our problems are contained in your word. And yet, Lord, sometimes we won't even pick it up. So, Lord, it's my prayer today that God's people would be holier. Holier today than they were yesterday. Holier tomorrow than they are today. That's my prayer, Lord. And my prayer, Lord, would be that we would experience a revival in America, which hasn't been experienced in over a hundred years. That people would be called to the throne of God, that they would repent and turn from the evil of the world and turn towards the only one who can make a true difference in their life, Jesus Christ. So, Lord, we thank you for the opportunity that we have today to come to your throne, to lay our burdens at your feet. It's our prayer here today at New Life, Lord. If anyone is ready to accept the Lord, whatever we might be able to do to, to facilitate that, Lord, it would be our desire. If there's anyone here, Lord, that needs to be scripturally baptized, anyone that desires church membership, anyone that has a prayer need, anyone that needs to pray at the altar of Jesus Christ, we can pray anywhere, but sometimes it's just more effective to kneel. Whatever the need might be, Lord, whatever the, the concern might be, we just want to do things, we want to do things your way. Not our way, your way. So I pray, Lord, that all our thoughts would be pushed aside. All our other things would be pushed away. And only the will of the Holy Spirit would speak to us now. And we pray these things, Lord, in the magnificent name of Jesus Christ. Amen.